So today I'll be demonstrating how to make mead from washed comb. And there is a comb. This is one that I did yesterday, you've combed it all broken apart, so all I have to do is wash it. And this way we can make mead. The honey can't be extracted, because this doesn't fit in the extractor. But we can use water and dilute. We can use dilution. And of course there's a little bit of a trick, because how do we know how strong it is? Well, that I'll show you guys. So first, what we do is we scrape the honey off the comb. And of course this is not the medieval way, because they didn't have Langstroth uh, frames. What they did is they would have their comb uh, grown free hanging in uh, skeps and it had little sticks on the top and each stick would have free hanging comb very similar to top bar hives which is still um, a method of beekeeping used especially in third world countries who don't have the capital to buy all the very nice but having to be made with tools um, equipment top bar hives are really cheap scap hives are really cheap and they did not need to kill the complete hive to get the honey. They would kill hives, but that was because those were hives that they didn't want to keep, but not because they wanted the honey. So keep that in mind. That's sometimes a bit of a uh, myth that goes around. So I put my little painting in here. And I can try and get right under the honey. There. This is a special hive. This is as close as I can get to a uh, free comb because this doesn't actually have an inner plastic, which is really cool. You can see all of the compartments, the hexagonals, with all the honey in. So I'm not capping it because I'm going underneath and I'll be using my fingers later on to break it all up even more. So this is a different technique from honey harvesting done with a Langstroth. This particular frame could have been Langstroth, but it had a little bit of uh, uh, wax moth damage. So I wanted to uh -huh, do this demonstration anyway, and I don't have an extractor, so I'll be using it this way. There we go. Beautiful comb. And with the way that they'll be harvesting this, we're not going to, we're going to try not to dilute the wax. Which means that I'll be able to use all this wax too. And there is a thought that for a long time, meat might have been more of a side product than the actual, what the medieval beekeepers were going for. Because when the churches needed for their religious uh, processions, when they needed wax candles, wax was more important than honey. Honey, in a way, was a side product. And with the Reformation and the dwindling need of uh, candles for religious use, suddenly the need for wax went down need for beekeeping went down. Bees weren't kept in the same mounds by monasteries and churches as they were before. And you can see a drop in the production of meat as well. High meat becomes a lot more expensive. You can see that how they're beautifully connected. 
And I've got crystallization in here as well. So I couldn't actually very easily have um, extracted this because of the crystal the crystallized honey. So also what I've done, what I've used this method for is when I have a hive that died over winter and they still have honey in there because they didn't use up all their honey. But it's crystal, crystallized because it went through winter. Well, this is a way. I mean, you could give it back to your bees, but I've only always had like one or two hives at a time because I have a huge field of corn up front. And whenever we find that, whenever their corn is grown, I can't keep bees. They don't. They don't thrive, and if they don't thrive here in upstate New York, then they don't get through the winter. So I tend to have one hive, maybe two, occasionally. So when they die, I don't have anybody to give my wax and my uh, honey to. There was actually a honeycomb in there too. There! We're adding everything. See, we've got a nice amount of comb in here. That'll be good. It'll be strong. So now we have a pot full with warm water and wax comb. So you can see the wax floating on top. This is very important. You want the wax to be not melted. So you have to stay below 150 degrees Fahrenheit for your water. Honey likes to dilute to warm water, so I use like anything that doesn't hurt my hands, something that's nice and comfortable, like 120 degrees, something around there. Um, this would kill regular yeast, but the endemic yeast in honey actually is a different type of yeast. It's an osmophilic yeast. It has a higher uh, heat tolerance and it has a higher sugar tolerance. So if I would want to ferment with the endemic yeast, I also don't want to heat it so the wax melts. Because it's the same thing. You melt the wax, you have your wax in your meat. You don't want that. But also you kill your endemic yeast. So for now, we're going to break this up. This is both boring and kind of cool. Feels fun. And there's a lot of uh, crystallized sugar in here. So it'll take a little bit. So the different ways that honey was harvested, and I always found like envisioned it as different grades of honey. That it's got nothing to do with modern grades. But when a honey came out of the beehive, it would be broken out by by hand from the top bars of the hive. So you have these these big pieces of comb, but this is all unbroken. Only the top is broken. So they would put all these bits and pieces of comb on a lattice work with a bucket underneath and they would catch the honey that would drip out. It would also catch the honey that wasn't capped off yet. It didn't have a cap yet, that would be the honey that wasn't quite evaporated to the right strength yet. It didn't have quite the right density yet. That also ferments really quick. The bees had none that yet because they were still evaporating it. That stuff would also drip out. That combination of broken up honey and the not quite there honey, the proto honey, is very rich in viable yeast. That would be called beforehand, and that would be very precious. It would be called the life honey. So when you see recipes asking for life honey, initially that meant the honey that came out all the way at the beginning. It was the most precious, and it would be able to start the meat. It would be able to be the fermentation starter. It was the source of yeast. Later on, uh, if you look in Digby, the word life honey changed 
uh, definition a little bit, and it still means a high quality. So it, it did keep the high quality bit, but it didn't keep the yeast bit. And that's probably because by then, and we're talking 17th century, by then um, you could buy yeast. Yeast was widely available. And the recipes reflect that too. The early, early, early recipes, they don't say where the yeast comes from. They just say you add live honey, you boil your honey, and then you add your live honey at the end after boiling, and then you get meat. Well, that's because the live honey is where the fermentation comes from. And they might not actually have realized that, or they might have, it just doesn't reflect, it's not reflected in the recipes. Wow, that's nice and broken up. And by the 13th, 14th century, um, like the Tractatus Magnatus, that one has a recipe and it's asking for beer lees for barm. So then they're starting to use, they know what yeast is, it's the foamy stuff that is made when uh, brewing beer. And they know that that can be transplanted to make beer, other beer, to make meat, to make bread, to make all kinds of things. And that's when the whole life honey story starts to change as well. And I guess I start to feel that the little balls are getting gummy. There's not as much crystal, crunchy stuff. It's, it's starting to feel like chewing gum. This is wax. Okay. Stick it together, make wax out of it. But this is everything. This is the very, very pretty top, the capping wax. It's that yellow stuff. But it's also the brood. Well, not brood. There was no brood in here. It's just... But yeah, any old wax is in here. There's propolis in here. There's everything. So when I start... And when I'm going to melt the wax, this wax will be of a lesser visual quality than capping wax, because it will be much darker. It will burn just the same. So now we know where the yeast comes from. Which might be a question of yours. Another question might be, how do we know the density of this? What is the, the, the specific gravity? How can we ferment this? Well, I think initially it didn't matter that much because they were using the osmophilic yeast and it does really well with high sugar concentrations. So I'm, I'm guessing, I'm assuming, same with beer brewers, they knew what they were doing. They would taste it and they'd be like, yep, that's, that sounds about sweet enough, that tastes about sweet enough. We'll put the life, uh, the life uh, honey in and we'll cap it up. Um, this is a fairly short meat. This would be fairly sweet and um, about a, a month old. I'm finding with the osmophilic yeast that it ferments and at around three months it, it, get, it starts to get sharp. And not alcoholic sharp, but uh, lactobacillic sharp. It starts to sour. So it works well from in between one month and, and three months old. Which is different with the beer yeast because that you can get a higher alcohol and then it preserves better if you can keep it oxygen free. Osmophilic yeast is also a little bit less good at converting to alcohol so it's much slower to go and it doesn't go as far. So it's a definite alcoholic fermentation yeast. It totally works. I've done it several times, but it, it's not as robust and it's not as high energy. It doesn't go as quick and it doesn't go as high, but man, it can take the high sugar level. So there was no started using the barm, there was a need for density test because you get stalled fermentation if the sugar levels are too high. So you need to know what it is. Well, for that, we need to go filter. So I'm going to wash my hands and I'll be back. So the next step is filtering this bunch of stuff. All the wax. Through cheesecloth into a second flounder. Second stock pot. Mm. 
And there you go. You can get all the liquid out. So another thing that was great was if this was squeezed or not. So this would be a lower grade than honey dripped right out of broken comb. Not the live honey, but the regular comb broken up. That would be the second best. Third best would be washed. Fourth best would be this stuff, if I would squeeze it. And uh, Tosser, in his uh, perfect husbandry, he is like, well, we need to be frugal, so we're going to squeeze this and make sure everything is used. Um, the butler, ah, Charles Butler from uh, a, a, a Feminine Monarchy, he is like, no, you don't want to squeeze that. That is the uh, grade for the servants. We don't want to have that in. That's the bad stuff. We'll feed it to the servants downstairs, but we won't. We don't want to have that in there ourselves. I don't really care. Meat is meat. But this does have a lot of flavoring. And it's not a waxy flavoring per se. It is a propolis, a pollen, the wax, but then all the all the bee things, everything that goes on, all the flower stuff that, that happens, all the nectar, all the honey, it all is in the wax as well. So this makes a much spicier mead than you would have when you have clean honey with no wax whatsoever. And having the, the wax in contact with warm water releases more of this um, spicy propolis pollen wax uh, mixture. And that was also something, I have one recipe that is calling for a poignant, the spicy meat. And it really looks like what they're doing is they're boiling wax, heating wax, to make a spice, to put back in a washed comb meat, to make it really spicy. There are some regular pepper spices in there as well, but not enough to make a spicy meat. We would put much more in. And when I made it, I found that Adding this through the boil was really good, but it also created problems because then you get particularized wax and you got it doesn't come out out of your meat. It doesn't settle down. It goes up. It doesn't go down, so you can't easily uh, rack it back off. So you gotta be a little careful. I'm not gonna boil this and put it back in. I thought I found it too much of a hassle. I had also a bit of a weird mouthfeel. It was like your your meat came with built-in lip balm. So keep that in mind. So this goes in with my other little bin of leftover wax and we'll be making wax out of that. So next is we need to figure out the density and for that we're going to use an egg, nicely rounded, get an average egg. Can't really you never quite know exactly what the density is, but if you get an average egg in shape, is in diameter, in size, in weight, and in freshness, then at least you have those con those variables mostly constant. There are still variables in which chicken, how healthy it was, what it ate, if it was a summer egg or a winter egg. So there's tons of variables anyway, so you can't really go like, oh, I'll test a whole bunch and get the numbers and then just use those for any egg. It doesn't work like that. It is a natural product. There is variation. But the variation isn't that big. So first we're going to do is check our egg. And we want our egg to lay flat. And where I'm seeing this is a grocery egg. Yeah, it pretty much now the point is a little higher. I think the pup is a little higher than the point. So the 
I'm uh, having a diagonal like that instead of this. So I need to adjust that for that when I stick it in there. Always check your water first. Now I'm gonna put, put it in here. If this has is this if this is the same density, the same specific gravity as water, it will go right down and have that same uh, angle. But it isn't because it's got a, a chopped lot of sugar in. The honey is all diluted. It's all in here. So this will tell me how much by floating. The more particles in solution, the denser the liquid, the more floating it can uh, give to the egg. And this is how I can see. This is actually period. And there. Oh my goodness, it's actually spot on. So, oh no, it's a little... Yeah, I want it a little, so I'll put a little bit of water in. So over here at the last bit, my must is almost ready. Proof my egg. I put a little bit more water in. And it floats with the size of about a quarter showing, which is exactly what I want. And I'll show you. That's our egg. Bloop. And we want it to be in this vertical. We don't want it to be floating like that. I've done that, but for that you need the osmophilic yeast. This is good for a sweet... Um, a sweet regular yeast meat, but since I am going to be using bread yeast, I'm going to make it so it floats just about there. I've got a little bit of clean warm water and the thing is that you don't want to add too much at once because the density is changing over there but not over here so we want to slowly make sure everything's okay and when you think no this is pretty much this is pretty good i think it's the same everywhere and you're not where you want yet. Put in some more. Whoop! Is that the size of a penny now? A little more. So if you do go too far, all I have to do is add a little bit of honey. But don't add the honey like this. Add it already diluted. Because if you put solid honey in, you have to, it's not changing the density because it's it's not a solution. So you have to have it in solution before you add it, if you want to double check your density with the egg. Well, actually with, the, with any hydrometer. Oh, we're getting close, we're getting close. Now we're at the dime. A little bit more water. Because then I can do two carboys. And if you're thinking like, whoa, this actually works out really well, how did she know? Well, I use this pot for brewing all the time. And I know there was about 10 pounds of honey in there. That's perfect. And I know one full pot is about what I do. Actually, one full pot uh, of extremely solid is what I do for a five gallon batch. But I've done this before, so I know one like this is about the, the right uh, density. And that's probably what they were doing back then too. They were like, oh, we'll put about two dozen combs in, and we put about like two potholes of water. And uh, that should be about that much, and we'll use the egg to fine tune it, and that's about it. They were not brewing commercial, reproducible, they were brewing enjoyable, alcoholic. And it's a little bit of a different mindset, but we can totally do that too. It's like we're brewing Tenzik, medieval brewing, Tenzik brewing. So I hope you all enjoyed it. All we need to do now is... That's actually pitchable temperature, but normally let it cool down if it's a little warm or warm it up a little if it's too cool. Put it in a carboy, pitch the yeast, 
and before you know it you have your own bubbling away and how I know that this is a wax mead is because of this little layer of scum it's a little ring of wax up there and it's annoying when you're cleaning but it doesn't do anything to the meat itself except for giving it very nice flavor so these meats i don't normally use this must as a mellow mel um you could you could spice it a little bit like a methaglin put a little galagal or something in or pepper long pepper but myself i like these straight up because they have such a unique and distinct taste you, and flavor you don't get that in anything else and I always like to make a, a bunch of bottles and bring this uh, to events to show for. We don't know what medieval meat would have tasted like, but I'm I'm guessing we're we're pretty darn close with with this version. There isn't much different apart from different honey and different yeast. I'm using bread yeast. The honey, oh, that's that's right. One caveat, um, I don't ever use uh, specialty honey for medieval brewing. I don't think they had specialty honey. Um, there is flavored honey. There's tons of flavored honey recipes. And a lot of them are actually infused honeys. They're not from the lavender flower. They're infused with lavender flowers. So it's a little confusing because it's not always that clear what they mean. There were monocultures of lavender fields, but there were not monocultures of uh, citrus groves, which is completely out of period for us anyway, and, and other um, flowers. There is uh, summer honey, spring honey, and there is fall honey. Um, I found mentions of went harvest, and that seemed to be it. Um, it kind of depends on where you, where you are as well. Uh, the more northern latitude you are, the more likely you're only going to have a spring and a fall. You're not going to have a summer harvest as well like they would have in the Mediterranean. And the honey that I have here, often I, I have friends with uh, backyard uh, hives. And what I like to get is either fall honey or all season honey where they didn't harvest um, the year before. Uh, or only harvest once a year and the honey taste is so diverse in and of itself that doing that washed comb with a backyard um, um, source makes for phenomenal need and if you want to know how phenomenal this is the process that I used um, for a brew that for me that I entered in the American Homebrewers Association two years ago, and that got uh, first regional and second national, or it, yeah national. That was really cool. And if you're a beekeeper or a friend with beekeeping, it is also very good for using those last bits and pieces. Like if your uh, friend has bees and uh, doesn't know what to do with the wax cappings, just rinse them out and make some must. I found with uh, a normal uh, backyard amount that that actually makes one or two gallons of meat. So you don't want to throw that down the sink. Everybody enjoy? And I think this might be about as close to medieval meat as we can make it, as we can make it happen. So happy fermentation!